Hi everybody, my name is Adam Pick and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Timing Heart Valve Surgery. If I've yet to meet you, I'm a former patient and uh, the founder of heartvalvesurgery.com. Our mission is to educate and empower patients with heart valve disease. This webinar, which has had over 300 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, is designed to support that mission. During the webinar, all participants will be in listen-only mode. That being said, you may submit questions during the webinar. Simply post your questions in the control panel that is usually on the top right part of your screen. We will do our best to address your questions during the Q&A section of the webinar. Lastly, at the end of the webinar, we are going to ask you to complete a very quick five-question survey about this event. Now, I am thrilled to introduce the featured speakers of the session. Dr. Patrick McCarthy is the Executive Director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago. Dr. McCarthy has achieved national and international recognition in the fields of complex adult cardiac surgery, including valve repair and replacement and atrial fibrillation. He has performed 10,000 heart operations of which more than 4,000 involved valve therapy. Dr. McCarthy is also the number one patient-recommended heart valve surgeon at our website. Dr. Robert Bono is a world-renowned cardiologist at Northwestern who specializes in the medical treatment of valve disease. So you know, Dr. Bono is the past chair of the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association Task Force, of practice guidelines of patients with valvular disease. I could go on and on about the careers of Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Bono and their achievements in cardiac surgery. Instead, I will tell you that these men are celebrated by our community and for good reason. Since launching this website in 2006, Northwestern has successfully treated many patients from our website including Robert Winter, Sarah Bloomfield, Ron Rovin, Gene Cook, Sharon Knickerbocker, Lisa Woods, Mark Redho, John DeFazio, Carol Rice, Charlotte Hartzell, and most recently, Debbie Cross. Personally, I'm humbled that Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Bono are taking time away from their very busy practices at Northwestern to share their experiences and clinical research during this educational webinar. So to start, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Robert Bono. Dr. Bono? Well, thank you, Adam. Great pleasure to be back with you again. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the issues regarding uh, timing of surgery. This is a, a difficult discussion many times. One way to start is to think of your heart as being like this car. Uh, I don't drive a car quite like this. I don't think even Dr. McCarthy drives this car. But, you know, uh, next slide, please. The reason I'm showing this is, you know, this is a machine that's very efficient. It's got a motor and fuel lines and valves and electrical system, and somehow when you turn on the gas uh, and, and you put your foot on the gas, it, it, it goes. It's got mechanical energy. Well, your heart works the same way. Next. Um, because your heart's got all these same components, and when things work well, it's good, but like, it, like your car, anything that could go wrong might go wrong, and today we're going to be talking about the valve. Next one. So the valves, are, there are four valves inside the heart. Uh, we do a cutaway here. Next slide. Um, this is a, a, a view of the chambers of the heart, the pumping chambers, the ventricles. Next one, Adam. So here we see the right ventricle and the left ventricle. These are the major pumps. Next. And here we see three of the valves. We're not seeing the fourth valve, but what we're going to be talking about today are when the valves on the left side of the heart the aortic valve and the mitral valve start causing problems because most of the valve disease we see uh, in this country is disease of the aortic valve or the mitral valve. Those are the predominant uh, problems. So we're going to be talking about that for the next several minutes. Next one. Now, heart valves are really important. Your, your heart valves open and close over 40, 40 million times in the average year. Next slide. So you can quickly do the math on this. You see by the time you're 65, these valves will open and close 2.6 billion times. 
so there's wear and tear that can develop on these valves. Some individuals are born with problems in the valve, but even a normal valve, just through wear and tear, can either become tight like a rusty gate, doesn't want to open, or it may start to leak. Next slide, please. So it's not uncommon then, as we see people getting older. This is, these are data in, in, as you can see, thousands of people who are healthy, walking around and enjoying a normal life. By the time you get to be over the age of 75, almost 10% of people have a problem with the mitral valve. Next. And as you get to be older than 75, uh, about 4.5% of normal people have problems with aortic valve. This from this kind of wear and tear phenomenon. Next slide, please. So let's look at these valves a little more carefully. We're going to slice the heart this way. Next slide. And take away that left part and view it from this direction. So we're going to turn the heart on its side and look in from the left. So this is the kind of view we get when we do echocardiograms. So when we do magnetic resonance imaging studies. Next slide. And so now we're just looking at the anatomy again. This is the left ventricle, the mitral valve, and the aortic valve. So the mitral valve is the inflow valve to the major pump, the left ventricle. And when the ventricle squeezes, that mitral valve closes. Next slide. And blood flows out the aorta. Now, when you develop disease of the aortic valve, again, it can look, act like a rusty gate. It may start getting tight, which is what we call aortic stenosis, meaning the valve is getting too tight. Next one, please. So now we see what happens. You get a buildup of pressure below that valve and less flow going through the valve. It's like putting a nozzle on a hose. Uh, and you get a uh, uh, higher velocity of blood going across that valve because of the uh, tightness of the valve. In fact, that's how we assess how tight the valve is with our echocardiogram. What's the velocity of blood? Next slide, please. Also, the valve might leak, uh, in which case the valve is like a rusty gate that's stuck open, doesn't close all the way. What that happens then is you see blood is going back into the major pump, the left ventricle. That's going to make the ventricle get bigger because of the extra volume going backwards. Next slide, please. So here are the problems that can occur when you've got aortic stenosis. You get a higher pressure in the left ventricle to open that valve. This causes thickening of the, of the muscle. That's if you are lifting weights, so the muscle gets thicker. Over the course of time, that can lead to a weakening of the muscle and cause heart failure. And because of the problem with uh, those higher pressures or not enough blood getting out through the rest of the body and the brain, you might get symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pressure, or lightheadedness. If the valve leaks on the bottom, may work the vegetation, you get that enlargement of the left ventricle. We want to keep an eye on how big the ventricle is becoming. That can also make the muscle get weaker over the course of time. And the kinds of symptoms patients get are being either short of breath or having chest pressure. So anyone with aortic valve disease, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, symptoms become very important. We don't want to miss those. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, the mitral valve can also cause problems. And the, the usual problem that occurs with the mitral valve is that it leaks. Next slide. So you get, instead of that valve closing properly, you get these high pressures going back into the left atrium. Not enough blood is going forward. And those high pressures in the atrium can tra transmit themselves back into your lungs and make you short of breath. In addition, next one please, Adam. Uh, those high pressures also make the atrium get bigger. And dilate. And when the atrium gets bigger, that's a problem because that's when you can start developing rhythm problems in the heart, such as atrial fibrillation, where the atrium starts going very fast. That can be a cause of strokes. Next slide, please. So the problems with mitral regurgitation are that you can get weakening of the left ventricular muscles, working harder to get enough blood going forward. Elevated pressures in the lungs, is short of breath. Atrial fibrillation from the big uh, increases in size of the atrium, the risk of strokes. And then finally, the high pressures in your lungs can also make the right ventricle uh, begin to malfunction so that the tricuspid valve can leak. Dr. McCarthy can talk about that because many times when he repairs the mitral valve, he also has to repair the tricuspid valve. Next slide, please. So this is our job then when we're seeing patients when we're talking about timing of surgery. We want to do this late enough that it justifies the risk of the intervention. Next. But we also want to do it early enough to prevent irreversible muscle dysfunction of the ventricle, high pressures in the lungs, what we call pulmonary hypertension, or these chronic rhythm problems. Next, please. And in some cases, we want to do it early because if we operate early, 
properly, we also make people live longer and we prevent premature death. Finally, one more for me, Adam, is this final slide. Here's some topics for, um, for discussion. How rapidly does valve disease progress? It's highly variable. It's usually slowly progressive. So you need to keep an eye on this. Uh, and it's hard to predict exactly how rapidly it will occur. This is why you need to see your cardiologist frequently uh, at his, his or her discretion. Have these tests done periodically. Are the medications to delay progression? Not really. These are some plumbing issues. There's no medicine to make things structurally normal and either prevent narrowing or um, leaking. The risk factors accelerate progression. They do, particularly aortic stenosis. If you have a high cholesterol, or if you're smoking, things like that, that can make the aortic stenosis get worse more quickly. Is imaging useful? Absolutely. You need to do echocardiograms. Sometimes you do magnetic resonance imaging, sometimes CT scans to uh, characterize what the ventricles are doing, how tight the valves are, how leaky they are, and how often depends upon the severity of the problem and whether things are showing signs of progression or not. Sometimes we do echocardiograms every two years. Sometimes we do echocardiograms every four to six months. Are there other tests? Not really. Sometimes blood tests can help. Um, blood tests is determine how hard the heart is working. Uh, we can talk about that later. These are called biomarkers of you know, being in the, the promising and blood tests. The, the major tests are imaging tests. Second opinions, very important. We see many patients who come here for second opinions, and we always recommend to our patients when there's difficult decisions to get all the information you can, uh, get, get good, credible advice from people who know a lot about heart valve disease. And do physician guidelines help in management? We believe they do. They help to kind of standardize the care of our patients uh, as we get more information and more uh, evidence about the right things that, that to do, uh, especially in this case, to start considering earlier surgery. Uh, these guidelines uh, do help to kind of codify the way that the uh, physicians are talking with their patients and sending our patients to uh, good surgeons like Dr. McCarthy. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to him, Adam, so that he can tell you uh, how he addresses many of these questions also. Thanks, Bob. Hi, Adam. Let me know if you can't hear me. I brought the phone over closer, and so hopefully you'll be able to hear me. You can move on to the next slide. First, uh, Adam, I want to thank you once again for all that you do for the patients in this community. Wednesday is my office day, and I saw 10 new patients today, and I think three of them were holding your book when I walked in to see them. And not only is it good to get the patient's information, but also to get them the right information, uh, which is easier said than done. So Bob had referred earlier to the impact of the guidelines, and I wanted to give the surgeon's perspective. First of all, these are essentially a guide that is published by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. And uh, Bob Bono was the lead author for years on this and is still uh, one of the people that is on the guidelines committee. And it's a group of experts that get together and they try to come up with what should be, in a sense, the rules for when patients should go for surgery. They are called guidelines, not absolute laws or rules, because every patient is different and we have to customize it depending on the patient. But um, my perspective, and most of us, is it's very helpful regarding the timing. And I'm sure there is a, a version of it that you must cover on your website. But uh, uh, in particular, when we're talking to counseling about when to operate on a patient, it comes in very handy. The situation where it's most handy is when the patients have no symptoms. When they're asymptomatic, they feel fine. I see patients that run two or three miles a day. They've been exercising. They and their spouse or significant others say they haven't noticed anything different. So uh, for that group of patients, they have to go through an open heart operation. And uh, it helps to know that uh, we've really reviewed this with a group of experts and come up with reasons why people may need to have surgery. Um, they're not always helpful, or I guess I would say less helpful. Um, the guidelines are described almost as Bob had described as if you have aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis. But some patients have disease involving two or even three heart valves. And they may have a leaky valve here and a narrow valve there, stenotic valve. And then it's a little bit more complicated. And so 
they may develop symptoms even though each valve in itself may not be so bad that we would need surgery. Um, also in the guidelines they talk about a, about a quote center of excellence. In particular if you're going to operate on a, on a patient that has no symptoms and put them through a life-threatening surgery you want to make sure that they're going to have as low a risk of an operation as possible with the best possible long-term outcomes. And then especially for the aortic uh, valve and aortic aneurysms, we haven't defined that yet. And then also the choice of the valve, we essentially leave it up to the patients if we have to replace the valve. And um, the guidelines give some perspective on that, but ultimately it comes down to a discussion with the patient. Can I have the next slide? Um, there are different factors that can impact timing as well. Like if I see a patient with mitral regurgitation, that leaky mitral valve, if they also have tricuspid regurgitation, that's going to push me towards earlier surgery because I know that that valve is pretty advanced. The pressures in the lungs must be going up, causing that second valve to leak. Or if a patient has aortic stenosis, but then we're also seeing a mitral valve leaking related to the aortic stenosis, we know that the other valves can be sort of a symptom that the patient is also developing problems. Um, Bob had mentioned atrial fibrillation. The atria are the upper chambers of the heart, and they frequently become enlarged in heart valve disease, and then they fibrillate, which means they quiver, so they don't contract the way that they're supposed to, and you can form a blood clot. The blood clot could break off and cause a stroke, or it could go elsewhere. You hear the Pradaxa commercials on the news at night all the time about that. So if a patient has enough valve disease that they've formed atrial fibrillation or they've developed atrial fibrillation, it's another uh, factor that may say it's time to operate on that patient. There's a specific condition called bicuspid aortic valve disease. John Ritter, the comedian, had that. About 2% of people are born with only two leaflets or a bicuspid aortic valve instead of the normal three leaflet. They also may form an aortic aneurysm. The aorta is the big blood vessel that leaves the heart and it gets enlarged. They're at risk for uh, the complications from an aneurysm, uh, such as rupture or the layers may split. So there's other things that also impact the timing. Some things may make us less prone to do surgery. So for instance, um, you'd heard from Dr. Bono about how many patients may be elderly. They're well into their 80s or even saw a 90-year-old patient earlier today. So if those patients have kidney problems, such that we're worried they may go on dialysis, if they go through surgery, if they have emphysema. Earlier I saw two patients that were thought perhaps had early cirrhosis. That also can impact the risk of an operation. And so those are the type of factors that we have to take into account as we talk to individual patients about What's the risk and what should the timing be of surgery? And then another one harder to really um, put a number around is frailty. And you know, we see uh, earlier I saw an 89-year-old patient who had been chopping wood three months ago. But I also saw a woman who was 85 who has a bad back and arthritis, and she really hadn't been able to be very active for many, many years. And so for her, the risk of an operation is going to be higher. She'll have a harder time recovering from uh, someone who may be very vigorous. Next slide, please. Hey, Dr. McCarthy, it's Adam. And I just have a quick question for you. You mentioned what your first bullet point is that of the other valve disease where patients may, may not just have an isolate condition, but they might have multiple valves that have issues. I, I'm guessing that there are several patients on the line who are in that situation. And I'm curious to know, is it common that you operate on patients with more than one valve issue, or is it not so common? Um, it's actually quite common. I would say probably 25% of my heart valve operations have at least two valves. Um, and it's not that uncommon that we'll do three. So it may be patient referral that the cardiologists say, this is pretty complicated. It's going to be two, maybe three valves. And so they send them here. But one valve can cause a, a leak or a disease in another valve, and patients like re with rheumatic fever may have more than one valve involved, and so it's not that uncommon that we see, you know, at least two valves. Great, thank you. 
Next slide. Um, so there's a lot of new technology that we use to help us determine the timing. I had mentioned the bicuspid aortic valve, and on the right is a patient with a normal aorta. Uh, those different colors are indicating the flow pattern, and think of them as being like jets of blood. And normal on the right is this, if you have a garden hose and uh, it's just jetting out of there, but on the left is a patient with an aneurysm. And, you may be able to appreciate how the blood swirls around in there on the left. It's very abnormal, and in that group, it's almost like you put your finger over the hose, and then there's a jet that comes out, and it hits the wall of the aorta, and it can contribute to forming an aneurysm. It causes wall stress. So these are a very new kind of images that we use like this, but we're using them to help us um, determine do patients uh, need an operation. Next slide. Um, second opinions came up. Um, you know, and, and this is one we see very regularly. I think three of the ten patients I saw today were there essentially for a second opinion, meaning they feel fine. Or they have in surgery too early. Other patients have been turned down for surgery because they were told it was too late. Um, in some, you have to take into account their age and other problems. Is there more risk? to the surgery, then there is a benefit. Um, in some, it has to do with the experience. They may uh, want to find a surgeon that does a lot of heart valve surgery. Um, and so uh, some uh, surgeons do almost all coronary artery bypass, um, and then others do more uh, heart valve surgery. The other issues I mentioned was atrial fibrillation. Uh, whether you treat for that, it's called a maze procedure. And, Sometimes patients need a coronary bypass, and they may have heard various um, descriptions. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, and whether they need that, a second valve or a third valve or other issues that we hear about a lot. Um, people come to us a lot about minimally invasive or robotic approaches, and uh, I just always tell people the things I have in mind is what's the safest operation for them and what's going to be the one most effective, and that's the primary part. And then uh, we decide whether the, we can do that minimally invasive or not. Next slide. Um, it comes up, are most operations elective or do you have emergency valve surgery? So the vast majority of operations are elective. Some of the patients I saw today are going to be scheduling their surgery well after the holidays into January or even February. In particular, a leaky mitral valve. Um, those patients may be pretty much asymptomatic, and so they may be waiting quite a while. The same with aortic insufficiency, that leaky valve. But patients with aortic stenosis, where the valve doesn't open very well, um, many of those patients may be developing chest pain, which is angina. They may be very short of breath, which is a sign of heart failure. And occasionally, they'll even start to pass out. And those can be urgent. And sometimes, we even put the patient in the hospital. So many of that group of patients will try to operate on within 30 days. Um, and if they acutely have a leaky valve, like an acute aortic insufficiency from an infection, endocarditis, many times that group of patients may need emergency surgery like that night or the next day. And that could be from heart failure or blood clots forming, which is called emboli or heart block, which means they need a pacemaker. Next slide. Um, since I knew that we were going to talk about this here, I just quickly asked Jane uh, Cruz, who works with us, to pull our uh, valve experience. And so this about 4,600 valve operations. 83% are elective. Those are outpatients. About 15% were in the hospital for various symptoms, and so we needed to do surgery before discharge. Only 2% are true emergency uh, where there's some serious infection or other reason that they need to go, like, right away. Next slide. Uh, it comes up, should I have, if we have to replace the valve, which we do, especially with the aortic valve, should it be a mechanical or a tissue valve? So the Neither are perfect. Both have their pluses and minuses. It's in the guidelines. The mechanical valves, uh, the problem is you have to be on warfarin or Coumadin forever, really. The good news is that the valve will theoretically last forever. Um, but sometimes bleeding issues come up, and then we have to take the valve out and change it because patients can't be 
on warfarin. Um, and there is a risk of a stroke associated with those valves. So in general, they're not as popular as they were 20 years ago. The tissue valves for most patients, you can get rid of the warfarin after three months. Um, the older the patient is, the longer they'll last. I frequently tell a patient about 80. On average, it'll last about 30 years and come back and find me when they're 110. Um, so for the older patients, almost all of them will receive uh, tissue valves, but even younger patients, because if you're in your 50s, you may be able to get a so-called valve in valve, uh, which is a way to replace heart valves without surgery through a catheter, and we're already doing that. Next slide, I think we're coming towards the end. So watchful waiting, and if Bob wants to join in here too, that's fine. So some patients that have no symptoms and have a leaky mitral valve, we're in a period of what we call watchful waiting. And I guess the advice here would be, if you're watchful waiting, make sure you really are watching it. Every once in a while, we see someone that they were told in 2011, we'll just keep an eye on it, come back in six months. Um, but the problem is they didn't come back for about three years and then during that time their heart may get weak and uh, they may have developed problems that may be irreversible. The other is that if they're going to go with that, they should probably not shop around and go to several different centers because comparing an echo in one place with an MRI in a different place and how they do echoes is different. And so. Uh, apples to apples comparison is always the best and we use a stress echo uh, to help determine that. And then if they develop symptoms, they should let us know right away, like in particular fatigue, shortness of breath, any swelling, uh, chest pain, dizziness or passing out, heart rhythm changes which patients may feel that their heart's pounding, that sort of a thing. Next slide. So uh, what we're ending with is a patient that sort of summarizes a lot of this. This was a patient Dr. Bono had been following for a few years. She had mitral valve prolapse. That's common. It's in about 2% of the population. And uh, at the time when Dr. Bono first saw her, she was 33 years old. Um, she was very good, worked with them, and came back regularly. Um, and was doing fine. And yet uh, her heart started to dilate. So the valve is leaking, the pump is working overtime, so to speak, um, and then she started to develop some irregular heartbeats. Uh, so I did her uh, heart surgery that was Crispine uh, done about a year ago, and she's doing well. And afterwards, she recovered, and her heart muscle, which was starting to dilate, had gone back to normal. So that's an example of a patient that really followed carefully. You know, uh, Pat, I, I saw her just recently, and she's uh, returned to uh, kickboxing, so she's really very active now since she's had that surgery. She's not, she's not competitively kickboxing, but she doesn't want to get kicked in the chest, but she's doing a lot of good exercise now. All the more reason it's a good thing she had a good result, too. I'd hate to be the surgeon if she had a bad result and was a kickboxer. Adam, I think that's our last slide, isn't it? We'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, and so as we transition to the questions and answers session, I'll um, remind everybody that they can go ahead and submit their questions in the control panel that's um, in the upper right part of the screen. We've already gotten some great questions that we're going to go through from Rex and Jeremy and, and uh, Collins as well. Um, and to start, um, we have a question here that I think strikes home to a lot of people on the line, and this can't, comes in from Beverly, and she writes, my mom who's 72, is in good health, but recently diagnosed with aortic stenosis. She's been told that now is a good time to have surgery. I think she's incredibly scared and not talking about it. What are her risks of delaying surgery? How can I help her overcome her fear? And do you ever have patients who choose not to have surgery? And lastly, what happens to them? Well, this is a great question, and it's a real-life example um, of what we deal with uh, every day, Adam. Um, and it's hard to say too, th uh, too much specifically about uh, Beverly's mother, since we don't know all the details. Um, but let's assume that she's otherwise healthy, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of other medical problems going on. Uh, I have a very low threshold for sending a patient who's got severe aortic stenosis to uh, Dr. McCarthy because the risk in a person such as this of having a major complication 
or dying with surgery is under 1%. Uh, and if you wait instead until people have, uh, you know, heart failure or more severe symptoms, um, you may be waiting too long. Uh, now, if sh she already has symptoms, then she definitely needs to have surgery now because if, once people have symptoms, there's a risk of dying from this. So we don't want to scare people. This is why we look for symptoms because once people have symptoms with aortic stenosis, there's a clock ticking and a dark cloud that begins to uh, grow over your head. And we, to, we don't want to wait too long. Um, now, if she decides not to have surgery, I think it would depend, again, on the circumstances. If she has symptoms and is not having surgery, I'd be really concerned about that. Uh, what happens to them is they may die. Or the symptoms get worse, and when you do do the surgery, you may have uh, raised to the point where you don't get the kind of result you would hope for otherwise. If she has no symptoms, then this is where uh, some uh, getting good opinions from other people about the real indications for surgery. Um, you know, is it really the right time or not? Um, this is where you want to have uh, good input from uh, a lot of uh, good experts uh, and trust the people you're dealing with. The most important thing is you have good uh, uh, trust in the doctors that you're working with, that they have the expertise and the, and the, and the best treatments available uh, to give you the advice you need. What does Dr. McCarthy think about that one? So Adam, I think this is a, a good question, and I'll actually speak to the fear part of this because uh, I, I told people I'd be a little worried if someone weren't a little afraid going into open heart surgery. So uh, we see this one all the time, and what I tell people is probably the best way to deal with it is to just go and actually meet a surgeon and, and talk to them about it. The reason being that people kind of have it in their head about how risky this is and you know, they may be uh, thinking of things from 30 years ago or a friend of a friend in, in 1990 had a bad outcome or something they saw on TV. And so, for instance, for this patient, you know, without knowing the full story, as Dr. Bono said, the risk to her life would be less than 1%. Surgery would take about three hours. She'd probably be in the hospital about four or five days. Um, and uh, the risk for complications like infection is less than 1%, bleeding about 2%, um, heart attack or stroke or pacemaker about 1%. So somehow people think that, oh, it's open heart surgery, it's kind of a 50-50 chance whether I'll make it and I'll be, you know, in the hospital for weeks and I'll, you know, take months to recover. And it's really not like that at all. Um, and a lot of patients who are healthy that, uh, don't have any heavy physical aspect of their job um, anywhere from two to four weeks or back if they can do uh, part-time work. So, you know, a lot of times people come in and they're very scared and then they kind of hear about the process and what it's like and, uh, you know, they go home feeling a lot better and they're sort of like, okay, let's get this over with. Because what happens to them with every one of those conditions that you've heard about, if you wait long enough, it will, it's fatal in all of those uh, conditions. If I could just add, Adam, um, the other discussion we have with patients is this is not going to go away and it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse with time. And if she's in good health now at age 72 and we wait until she's uh, you know, 78 or 80 and she's older and has more medical problems and her heart disease has gotten worse, the risk of surgery is going to mm -hmm. go up. And this may be a better time to do it now, and the risks are quite low. Got it. And so a, a follow-up to that question, you both referenced the, the mortality rates here being very, very low at 1%. Now, is that data, um, is that standard across all cardiac centers, or how do you, is that at Northwestern? Where are you, how is that data being developed? So that is data published from Northwestern. Uh, Chris Malazri wrote that up a few years ago. I think it was 0.8%, and that's pretty much what we uh, do. Um, I did refer to that center of excellence concept uh, that there, you know, it's like practice makes perfect. If you do it a lot, you get better at it. And, um, and so I think we do have very good results a lot of places do that. But if you look across the entire United States, um, and that's called the STS database. You may hear about that. That operation may appear to be 3%. Um, so 3% is certainly higher than 1%. But for a patient who's 
otherwise facing a life-threatening condition without surgery, a 3% risk is still safer than not having surgery, especially if that's symptom. And Adam, we also have some data from Medicare where we essentially get all the information for anyone over the age of 65 having surgery. And as Dr. McCarthy said, the risk is in the ballpark of about 3% across the board. Even over the age of 85, where we have data from Medicare, the risk now is only about 5 or 6% if we choose our patients quite well and operate at the right time. Great. So moving on, uh, Brad writes, I understand your webinar is about timing surgery, but I want to know when and what technology might develop to eliminate the need for surgery. Any thoughts? Well, I think um, this is uh, Dr. Bono here, and Dr. McCarthy has got some really good insights in this as well. Um, we're in a stage now of transition where we're beginning to develop techniques to replace valves or repair valves without open heart surgery using techniques with catheters. Dr. McCarthy is heavily involved in, in a lot of that technology, involved in many of the trials, and we've had great experience here. At the current time, uh, these techniques are uh, being used in patients who are considered too sick for surgery or have a high risk for surgery. Uh, but as we get better with these techniques, we either replace valves or repair valves. Uh, undoubtedly in the future, the, the threshold is going to come down to the point where we're beginning to do this in people who are, uh, are less sick. So that's one of the reasons many times where we wait in someone who's got a valve condition that's not severe. Uh, maybe we don't need to do the surgery now, and if we can wait safely for another five to ten years, there may be some new technologies that come along. But right now, I still have great confidence sending my patients to an excellent surgeon like Dr. McCarthy because of the uh, results we have. Um, it, it's a, a kind of a, a proven technology that we have with surgery where some of these new techniques still need to be worked on. So, uh, Adam, I'd say um, over 10 years ago, we first started to replace the aortic valve without surgery uh, by using a catheter that goes up through the leg. It began in France and then has been growing across the world. When we first heard about it, we thought that it was science fiction. And now it's approved in the U.S., but only for patients who are very high risk because there is a risk for a stroke associated with the procedure. There's a risk that it can leak around the valve, and that may impact the survival of the patient. We don't know how long the valve itself will last, so there's still a lot of unknowns about it. Um, but it's kind of like 1965 with heart valve surgery. It's just beginning. Right now, it's an option for patients that otherwise would have to go through open heart surgery. And uh, 10 years from now, uh, we'll have worked through some of the current issues that we have, and it's going to be a little safer, and the technology will be a little bit better. Um, it's not often that I can see a patient and say there's a technology coming that would show up within a few months, such that I say you can afford to wait for it, because the timeline on these technologies usually takes kind of years. And so for a specific patient, when they're sitting there talking to me, many of them, usually need an intervention pretty soon, and they can't wait for that kind of a thing to change. Great. And so moving on, Patty asks, um, I'll be having uh, my aortic valve replaced in early December. I am hoping to have the mini surgery. What are the deciding factors for this? I'm 56, I'm a female, and I'm relatively healthy. Well, um, to be honest, the deciding factor is probably going to be who the surgeon is. Um, there are surgeons that do uh, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, and then there are others that it's just not something they do a lot. There are some that you wouldn't do it. Um, so, for instance, if you also needed a coronary bypass, that's sort of on the bottom of the heart. The aorta valve's up on the top of the heart. It's just you can't get there from here. If you needed also a mitral valve operation, that may be a little bit harder to do. Um, so I, I think you would just ask your surgeon, um, can uh, this be done minimally invasive? And uh, here we're probably about 80% of the patients are minimally invasive for aortic valve operations. 
Uh, part of it is body habitus. If it is a patient that weighs 300 pounds or something, it um, may be very difficult to, to essentially see uh, and get in there uh, and through a small two-inch incision. And so you have to make it three or four inches bigger. Um, so, uh, but in general, for this operation, that's a, a nice, safe operation to do minimally invasive surgery, but not everyone does it. Okay, and here is a question from Alan who writes in about valve tethering. I've been diagnosed with severe isolated trigusped regurgitation. A TE was performed that shows I have valve tethering, a septal and anterior leaflet. Heart function is still normal with ejection fraction at 50 to 55, and I exercise an asymptomatic. His question is, what, what is tethering? And you know, the follow-up is, do some of the newer repair techniques for this condition show promise for a long-term fix? And under what conditions would a surgeon do a valve replacement for tethering? Let me start with this uh, important question, and it, 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 it is somewhat technical, but you know, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve uh, is a, are complex structures where the valve leaflets are also attached to the muscle of the ventricles through these cords. Now, a valve can leak either because you have a disease of the valve leaflets uh, that we've been talking about, like mitral valve prolapse or tricuspid valve prolapse. The valves can also leak if the ventricles aren't behaving properly because they, these cords pull the valve in funny ways. So that even though the valve is structurally normal, if it's being pulled in a funny way, which is what we call tethering, uh, the valve can't close normally. It's kind of restricted in its ability to close normally. It's like having a uh, old-fashioned army tent with two flaps, and the, the flaps are normal, but you staked it out in a way that those cords are pulling the, the flaps out of position. So a uh, stiff breeze comes along and you haven't uh, staked out the tent well enough. Um, the flaps themselves are okay. There's a problem with the cords, and that's why the, the valve leaflets in this case are um, not closing normally. They're kind of um, pulled or tethered uh, out of position. That usually occurs in people who have symptoms. So uh, again, you can't figure out exactly what's going on here with Alan, but, um, but there could be an issue there. But those valves can also be repaired, and maybe Dr. McCarthy can talk about how he would approach a problem like that. So um, tethering of the valve with normal uh, right ventricular function and size is unusual. Usually when there's tethering of the valve, it's because the right ventricle is dilated and it's essentially pulling the valve down, causing tethering. So one of the first things would be to find out, you know, is there a different cause for the tethering? Like sometimes there's inflammatory reasons like rheumatic fever, an old history of that, or uh, endocarditis, which is an infection, and there's a, an unusual tumor uh, called carcinoid of the liver and things that can affect the tricuspid valve. So if it's just simple tethering that is doing it, um, essentially then it's going to depend on the amount of tethering. Uh, there may be just a small amount of tethering and maybe pulled down a little bit, but the annulus is dilated. And then if you put a ring around it, you make the annulus smaller and the leaflets will hit back together and they'll, they'll overlap properly. Um, but if there's a huge amount of tethering, and in particular if there's been destruction of the valve leaflets themselves from rheumatic fever, or endocarditis, or carcinoid or something like that, that type of patient may need a replacement. And so uh, those are the kind of things we cover with a patient individually before surgery and, and sort of prepare them for both. It might be a repair depending on what we find, uh, but we might have to replace it. Okay. And Louise asked the question, I've been told I'm needing surgery in the next one to two years. My aorta valve, and I think she, uh, Louise, she means aortic valve is narrow. I smoke. Is that going to have a negative impact on my surgery and or recovery? Uh, yes. So uh, the good news is that it's a ways away, and so you can quit smoking and, and get rid of that. But everyone knows that the first question I actually ask after I go in there and I meet the patient and we chat a little bit, I ask them uh, about other things, and the first question is, are you a smoker? Um, and if they do, um, it's 
because it affects their lungs. To go through open heart surgery, you have to uh, go on the heart lung machine. It's a general anesthetic. You have a breathing tube in. And the patients that are smokers, that affect the cilia, the lining of the lung. And so um, their, their heart may be totally fine, but sometimes their lungs have trouble afterwards. Now, uh, if I see a patient that is a smoker and they need surgery, we really would like them to quit smoking for at least two weeks before. Um, and so if she's told she may need surgery in the next one to two years, this is a great time then to really work at stopping smoking and doing whatever is available to stop that. Yeah, I would stop now. I wouldn't wait until one to two weeks beforehand. Uh, now's yeah. the time to stop. Get those lungs all nice and healthy. Yeah. Okay, we just have a question that came in from Linda Error. I don't have a slide for this one. She says, I am at point eight opening in the aortic valve. All my other valves are healthy. Is it time for me to have surgery? Did I hear point eight, Adam? That's Zero correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how we would define severe aortic stenosis. And uh, this is a difficult question, even in someone who's got no symptoms. When the valve is that tight, the likelihood of needing surgery over the course of the next five years is very high. Not everybody, but almost everybody over the next five years is going to start developing something that would want you to do the surgery, usually a symptom. And if the likelihood is that high, you really don't gain much in waiting. And you may lose something in waiting. So um, it's a difficult decision if you're really feeling fine. Uh, but as I said before, it's not going to go away. It, if it's already 0 0.8, which is very, a normal valve opens to about three to four square centimeters. 0 0.8 you know, is less than one square centimeter. You can start looking at the inside of a, of a fountain pan, and that's kind of what it looks like, very small opening. Um, well, it's going to get worse and make it worse quickly. Um, it would not be wrong to have that discussion now about having the surgery uh, while you're healthy. So Adam, I think uh, Dr. Mano also made an assumption that there weren't symptoms. If that patient has symptoms and it is 0 0.8, it's really time to have surgery because the risk for that patient's life in the next year is actually quite significant. So. Even when we have patients that say that they're asymptomatic, you talk to them for a while and they say, well, I used to be able to do this, but now I'm older and so I don't do that. And, you know, you're thinking, well, they're only 75. Um, and so what we do is an exercise echo frequently. What we'll do is that we put them on a treadmill, we do an echo before, and we have someone there to actually watch them uh, as they go through it. And we look for how the heart responds to exercise, uh, but also we look to see if their blood pressure drops because that narrow opening is about the size of a dime or smaller. And uh, as you start to exercise, your blood pressure should go up. But if you have that obstruction to the flow, your blood pressure may actually drop when you exercise. And in that case, you really should have surgery, even though you feel pretty good. And again, remember, this is a patient population that frequently tell me, you know, I think I must just be getting a little old because I'm kind of tired and I can't do this or that. It is amazing how many people who say they feel absolutely normal before surgery uh, feel a lot better afterwards um, because as Dr. McCarthy says, people stop doing things, they, they, they uh, um, have decreased their activity level and sometimes very uh, um, Total ways. They think they're just getting older and out of shape, and uh, many times it's their hard talking. Mm. Okay, so moving on uh, regarding kind of uh, travel, uh, specific to actually having a surgery done, T uh, Tam Nguyen writes in, I currently have bicuspid aortic valve with an aneurysm of 4.7. I'm planning to have my operation about eight hours away. Is there any restriction on travel after the operation, and how should I plan for follow-up after the trip? So we see this a lot, where patients fly up here for surgery. It's not uncommon to do that. Um, what we typically uh, do, obviously, it depends on the age of the patient, the condition, and family members with them and all. But if it's an otherwise young, healthy patient, frequently what I'll tell them is they get discharged from the hospital after about five days or so. We usually spend a few days here in Chicago. It's not bad to go to Michigan Avenue and go shopping for a few days anyway. Um, and then there's nothing wrong with an airplane. Uh, they're all pressurized, so that's fine. But 
they are tired. I tell everyone, and so you know that's going to take a lot out of them to take the trip. The second is they can't lift anything over 20 pounds, so either they have to check their luggage or have somebody with them that's going to do all of that for them. They're not supposed to raise their arms over their head, so they shouldn't be lifting it up uh, to put something in the overhead. Um, and you know, I, I'm happy if they're going back to their cardiologist that sent them, so they're going home to a doctor that knows them well. Um, sometimes people want to go to, you know, Thailand on vacation or something a few weeks after surgery, and that's probably not such a good idea. But if um, it's a young, healthy patient and they can manage the logistics of travel, then we typically let them out of the hospital, see them in two or three days afterwards, um, and then clear them to fly home. Great. And here's a, a question that just came in from Roseanne Caseforth. Uh, again, I don't have a slide for this, but um, it's an interesting question. My son, 18 years old, has bicuspid aortic valve with aortic stenosis, and his aorta is enlarged in slight thickening of the heart wall. He also has regurgitation. His stenosis is now in the serious category, he is restricted from lifting weights, the doctor is still waiting for symptoms. He has occasional lightheadedness when standing, and doctor knows this, but isn't concerned. He recommends a stress test this spring. We've been monitoring this for five years. I'm concerned that he isn't having uh, surgery soon enough and will miss the symptoms. Uh, do you have any thoughts for Roseanne? Well, Adam, I hate to weigh in from a long distance on this one, but it gets back to this whole point about getting all the opinions you can. So it sounds like uh, the mother is appropriately concerned about her son, and from what you're describing, I would be concerned too. Um, and so uh, get all the opinions you can. Um, <laughs> what's going on with this lightheadedness? So that, that sounds like if he's got tight aortic stenosis and is lightheaded, that sounds like a symptom to both Dr. McCarthy and me as we're looking at each other when you were describing this. Um, so I'd be concerned too. Uh, again, I don't want to tell you what to do from long distance, but I certainly would tell you to get all the opinions you can to feel reassured. Okay. And here's, a, here's an interesting question from David Clark, who writes in, uh, two weeks ago, I had replacement of my aortic root and aortic valve. My question is, how do I prevent infection of my pig valve and what precautions should I take to care for it? Well, this is a great question, and it goes back to why we don't recommend replacing valves in everybody um, who has uh, valve disease. We wait until there's a real indication for it, um, because there is a risk of infection, and the infection is somewhat greater um, after you've had valve surgery than before. And so uh, it's not that great a risk, however. Um, and therefore, I wouldn't be overly concerned about this. What we do recommend is that you take antibiotics whenever you're in a situation where you're going to put bacteria in your bloodstream, and the leading cause for that is seeing a dentist. So we do recommend that you take antibiotics uh, one hour before seeing a dentist. If you can take penicillin without an allergy, it's pretty simple. You take uh, two grams of a drug called amoxicillin, which is a kind of penicillin. Uh, that is pretty good at preventing this. It's never 100% effective, but the risk is, is literally in the ballpark of one in a million of getting an infection when you see a dentist. It's not zero, but it's quite low. But you can help reduce that closer to zero with antibiotics. Uh, I would just add to that, that I tell my patients basically any time they go in to see a doctor, or an ER, anyone that's going to do a procedure to let them know that they have a, a heart valve um, because the dental profession, the medical profession, we're all pretty in touch with that. And so if someone came in with a fever and a concern for an infection somewhere and we knew they had a heart valve, they'd probably be a lot more aggressive about treating it with antibiotics. Yeah, I mean, take uh, take any uh, time you have a fever uh, or a fe fever and chills and things, take that seriously because it could be an infection on the battle. But uh, again, I would not be overly concerned about this. It sounds like you had a good operation for a good reason. I took a dark cloud away from you, and now you've got uh, very little of a dark cloud uh, hanging around here related to the risk of infection. Okay, and moving on is a question about exercise. Um, Charles writes, I have no symptoms, but was told that my mitral valve is a leaky one. I don't need surgery yet, but I exercise, bike, 
watts, will that impact the timing of my surgery? Probably not at all. Um, I'm assuming from what you've said here, Charles, that the valve is not leaking severely. That's why they're not recommending surgery yet. But the valve is not leaking severely, um, exercise will have really no effect on this. Uh, we would recommend you don't do a whole lot of heavy weight lifting. But biking and other forms of aerobic activity are quite safe, and they're not going to make this valve uh, uh, good any worse any more quickly. Okay, and we have one other question here. Um, let me see, coming in from... God, we have so many questions coming in here. Um, it's really quite amazing. Um, here's one from Rex who talks about, um, I had an aortic valve replaced three years ago and it appears this valve is functioning abnormally and is stenotic and regurgitating. Do we get bad valves occasionally? I have a cow valve. So Adam, if I heard the question correctly, um, we, you've had the valve replaced with a uh, called a bovine pericardial valve, cow valve, mm -hmm. and now it's both uh, tight and leaking. Um, it's hard to say exactly uh, how to manage that right now. It really depends on how severe this is. Um, a lot of times a valve that's been replaced will have a little bit of tightness or a little bit of leak, and that's not that's not a major problem, and we can just follow that. Um, so it depends on exactly what's going on in this situation as to whether it's a, uh, you know, severe leak or severely tight. Unusual for that to happen within three years, although it could happen. Um, chances are it's, it's okay to watch this if the uh, cardiologist and surgeon are recommending not doing anything at this point in time if you're feeling well. But if it is uh, really causing problems, then it's got to be followed very carefully. Okay, and with that response, we're, we're just running out of time here, but um, we're going to conclude the webinar, but please don't exit, exit just yet. Um, on behalf of the entire community at heartvalvesurgery.com uh, and all the patients with valve disease, I'd like to extend an extraordinary thank you to Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Bono for sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, please note that a video playback and written transcript of this webinar will be available at heartvalvesurgery.com shortly. And as we end the webinar, I'd like to thank you, uh, of course, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Bono, again, uh, all the attendees for this participation in this really special online event. And as we close, I'd like to ask you to complete a very quick survey that is about to appear on your screen. And as we always say here, keep on ticking. Thanks again for your time, and thanks, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Bono. <laughs>